Kolomosi Nida Shinzi Wichiwa Niu Kanewak Anishi Ki Shalamokwe Nino Njiai Nina Mohikanewe Shana Wisconsin Kolomosi Mwa Wak Kwat Anishi Nialagomati Yunami Lenape Lenapanewak Nika Wunji Yayo Lenape Hoking Naka wi kit yo an kahi. Anishik, opichi, anishik. Njus, anishik. Nialagomati, anishik creator. So what I just said was, and I don't know if my slides are up there, you can put them up there. The original inhabitants of this land were here that were here before us are actually from my tribe, the Lene Lenape. And there are three communities in the north part of New Jersey. There were the Muncie, the people of the Stony Country. In the central, Unami, where people down by the river, that's here. So I thank the Unami and ask them for permission to be here and be on their land. And in the south, Unalaktiko. Sorry, still learning my Lenape. They are, the pe they are the people near the oceans. Um, and I, I said hello everyone and thanks to the relatives uh, of the Yunami Lenape who are here. And I um, asked them um, for permission and to be on their land and to thank them. One of the things that I try to do no matter what conference I'm at, how big or small, no matter where I am, uh, Opichi, my cousin, Monique, who also works with us, and is a student, so I'm here to support students too, I can't wait to see the posters, helps me understand the history. And in nobody knows my name, nobody knows our name either, so I wanna just bring attention that, of the original folks that were here. And it wasn't until 19, uh, 1524 when the first European um, Giovanni di Veranzio came here, and then Henry Hudson in 1609 whipped through the um, Newark Bay. So I just wanted to say uh, we're here and we're still here and interestingly enough um, Monique and I are the seventh generations. We're the um, seventh generation of direct descendants that come from this land. And this is our tree. I think it's interesting that um, Stafford and I did not make our PowerPoints together but there's a lot of history and culture and context understanding the, the lineage of, that of we, where we come from and what we need to do today and, and the legacy that we want to leave as we reach out um, um, generations after us. So I'm the blue, all the way down the blue. And um, it's important, the seventh generation, because we were told uh, that there was um, Eddie Benton Benet, uh, Chocololi, who was our elder, said, uh, um, the seventh generation is different. Um, new people will emerge and re retrace their steps to find out was, what was left by the trail of ancestors. And our steps guide our journey. This is when Stafford said it was really professionally and personally important. Many of these folks, and you can't see, this is, there's two more people who aren't on here. Um, over 200 years of our ancestors here Henry Bowman was the oldest, 1815. Lewis Bowman isn't on here, and then it goes all the way down left to right. That's my dad on the bottom left, that's me. <laughs> and then those three pictures are the eighth generation. One that's not born is in my June. My sister will have a, her baby. And this is important for evaluation and for this forum because many of my ancestors, because of political, um, because of political and social pressure, because of being civilizing the Indian and the policies that were here, they couldn't put on some of their birth and death certificates and their enrollment when you sign them, you know, when they had to be put on the rolls, said they were American or white because it was that dangerous. And so I just am paying homage to the lineage that I come from and I'm glad I'm part of the seventh generation because I know that even my father, um, it's my Polish mother who encouraged us to learn our culture and language, not my father because of the, still the effects of boarding schools that was on my grandpa Morris over on the left there. And he, obviously we have entrepreneurs you can see. Grandpa Mose was somebody who helped, believed in social justice 
That's a World War II picture. So what does it have to do? I want us to be the generation. I'm part of that generation that I hope I can share information that helps change the way we do business in evaluation and research. Because some of the things that I heard Stafford talk about, whether it's um, in the 1930s about the, how the schools, the shape of the schools were in, we're literally having those reports right now. We're like 50 to 80 years behind in Indian country. And, and I'm, Monique and I, unless there are other Native Americans in the room, there's not many of us that are in higher ed. They're in evaluation and research, so it's really, really important for us to be here. Um, I really liked uh, um, the forum is about respect, balance, respect, balance, uh, balancing both theory and practice, changing theory and practice, and in that changing how we measure our success. So I think that the forum really, um, the, the concepts of respect and balance and, and different ways that we measure success really uh, are in line with a lot of the uh, Native American teachings that we have. Today I'm going to um, I'm going to organize my um, comments back around the three the three ways that the forum are supposed to be set up: surfacing important issues, examining them, and offering some responses. So the first I'd like to talk a little bit about history. We heard Stafford Trace uh, Roots as our evaluators. Under nobody knows my name, he provides us with an evaluation contracts in history and situating himself within that history and the ancestors. We, we have to do that work in, in Indian country. Um, it is important for us because we have to learn how to speak truth to power. And in, as people who, who are funded by big agencies who are hired by agencies that fund projects, we, we have to have culturally and contextually responsive evaluation. Um, without it, uh, and I'll use um, from Hood Hobson and Frierson's uh, um, both of their introductions in the 20, 2005 and 2015 book, without nuanced consideration of cultural context and evaluations conducted within communities of color and our poverty, there can be no good evaluation. And speaking truth to power starts with that self-knowledge and empowerment. So just like I'm up here struggling as I am trying to learn my language and speak what goes on, you too will struggle as you learn how to pick up hopefully new strategies to be more responsive in your practice and in, in, in within your organizations and in the designs that you use. Um, we have to use that uh, self-empowerment knowledge so that we can we understand the past of what we're offering and so we are present here as we're thinking very purposely about the work we do and who it affects as we walk together to make um, a better future about the way we do our business. Um, <clears throat> Uh, Dr. Hood directly tackles academia um, where the Western uh, theoretical, methodological, practical literature doesn't um, when he speaks uh, in Nobody Knows My Name. And he's had several, you know, this is a lot of his work published and just what he talks about. Um, Scholarly ignorance be gone, uh, he said. I really like that. And so I don't use the R word much, but, you know, I always say, now you know we're here, okay? Um, we're giving you tools, we're giving you opportunities. We hope that you use them and that this conversation continues beyond the five minutes that I have left. <laughs> um, I w uh, we hear about the importance of uh, Stafford's work, not only reaching back, but reaching in and staying in the communities and reaching out to students. We believe in you students, you're our future. Um, I think that, uh, when we talk about nobody knows our name, it reminds me a lot of hiding in the ivy, red earth, white lies, Native Americans and the myth of scientific fact, creationism and uh, ethnic pseudoscience um, that, um, you know, from Brian Brayboy to Vine Deloria Jr. Uh, all have given us much good information. Privilege comes in many ways. Um, I heard a lot about this at CREA conference and how do, why are we always the others? What does the othering do to us? We're always the ones named. So deconstructing that white privilege, Western privilege, academic privilege is very important. Privilege is more than race and socioeconomic status. I think about having the privilege, if I worked you know, as faculty at university, you know, part of my scholarly work would be have to publish stuff. You know? Well, as somebody who owns a small business, that's a very different reality that I have. Thinking about what theories and methods inform your practice. Critical race theory tribal critical theory, 
decolonization theory, resistance methods as a way to do your work. Anybody use those? S thank you, one person I saw. I know some other folks in here do, but if my point here is, if we think of it as a logic model, if we don't have different inputs on methods and theories, our outputs are gonna be to say the same, and this forum asks us to stretch, bend, and grow, and ask us to do our business differently. We don't wanna to contribute to more uh, colonialism through our scientific work, where we go in, and instead of taking raw materials from the earth, we start taking knowledge, and we're using it to get more grants, publish more, who has the right to data? Who owns it? Are you working with the communities? Are you publishing in their journals? How is it helping them? Or is it only benefiting you? Where is the power base? Does it come from the community? Or does it come from somewhere else outside the community? Um, <clears throat> does my lived experience, this was a quote I really liked of Stafford, uh, help me equip to be a responsive evaluator? You know, I guess it depends, and it's something that we question all the time. We as culturally responsive evaluators also are re very reflexive in our practice, and we're always very involved in our communities because you know, we, we feel like we bear a big burden you know, to get the word out. These are just some of the um, uh, other ways that we can get at um, thinking about theory and methods and evaluation, uh, these different theories, different ways to get at designing your studies, thinking about the work that you do. Sorry, I'm very cognizant of time. A blended approach. One thing we always believe in is how do we take what's in the Western or academic literature and try to build on it? Um, Nialagomati means all my relations. So um, I'm stock bridge Muncie. So I always say I'm trying to bridge and find ways that we can work together. So when I hear about different theories and methods, what does that mean for my work? I'm constantly thinking about that. Hell, even when I went through school, you know, I didn't really get one lecture, you know, about curriculum instruction, teaching, you know, leadership about, about American Indians, indigenous people. So, you know, I was always indigenizing things in my head. So this context is nothing new. Um, I want to get to the responding of the important issues. This is the part where for you to think about your practice and as we move forward and we'll get to visiting here soon. Um, like Stafford's mention of uh, Ambrose Calivers? Caliber. Caliver's work, thank you. Um, using an evaluation inquiry as a lever for social responsibility, I'd like to move from social accountability to, to social responsibility. I don't want, accounting to me comes from the outside, responsibility to me comes from the inside. How do we deconstruct whiteness in Western ways of evaluation so othering isn't always on us? How do we engage in culturally competent thinking and questioning? I really like Donna's, Donna's work here, Donna Mertens, um, Mertens and Wilson actually, I should say. Who am I? How do I describe myself? What groups do I belong to? Does my membership to the groups give me privilege and power? Are you open to self-examination? You know, lots of stuff to think about. And it's because of the relationships that I hopefully keep getting invited back to things or get to be, you know, whether it's CREA, AEA, the eval partners thing, you know, um, ears, building relations so that we can bridge those gaps and move forward together. How do we include political and legal theories as an additional component? One of the, one of the keys to my writing is we're not just about culture and language. I I feel like that marginalizes us, or people keep us there, instead of looking at the political and legal aspects of American Indian tribes. Very different than any other gr uh, group of color. You know, if legal theories were used under Plessy to help desegregate schools, you know, we have used our sovereign status, our legal and political status to save our bones and bring them back home, save our land, Lots of stuff, gaming, different things. I want to see it used more in our social science projects and research evaluation studies. As policymakers and leaders, how do you evaluate what you're doing? You're in charge of procurement, you're in charge of policies. If we have a literacy conference, we have literacy experts there. If you have culture in your projects, you should have cultural, cultural experts there. Unless you, you know, you are one, but even if you are one, we still always have our community members involved. So really look at that. A lot of these big regional ed labs, these ed labs that are millions of dollars are getting funding and they don't have rural or tribal or urban, you know, the different experts on there. Why are we doing that? How do you commit to diversity in your presentation and publication venues? 
Do you go to National Indian Ed? Do you go to uh, American Indian Higher Education Consortium Conference? I mean, those are just some of ours. National Congress of American Indians. A lot of them are doing evaluation and data sub, you know, data projects, bioethics around data, lots of really awesome things. I think this is my last slide. I just want to remind us that there's a, both a cultural and a technical response to our evaluation work. Um, sometimes when they hear, oh, she's Mohican or she's a native evaluator, then they, you kind of get marginalized that way. I'm like, no, really, I got trained as a researcher, you know, at a really good university and I've had a lot of 15 years of lived experience trying to figure that out, what it means, especially for evaluation. It's both. We have a cultural content and a technical content, uh, you know, content, knowledge, skills, abilities that we need to do. We're separate. We're not separate. Um, the Negro problem in education isn't just a Negro problem in education. The Indian problem in education isn't just an Indian problem. We really need to think about how we blend that. Just like braids in our hair, the four colors of the medicine wheel, all of those, we, we are working together as a human race to try to fix that or we're going to have the same chronic problems. Um, and then just remembering that through um, changing your practice, bending, stretching, and growing, those are ways to build relationships. It might feel a little uncomfortable. I tell a lot of jokes, so don't be afraid to ask me anything you want on or off the record. Um, but um, I hope that I'm making a whole new room full of colleagues that, I, that we can brainstorm ways or give you ways so you can commit to you know, some changes in your own evaluation practice or within your, your institution. Thank you so much.